Welcome everyone to the, well now it's the second annual Schaffner uh, Debates, all right, 2019 version. All right, we've been doing this uh, as, as a part of the Fenton Schaffner uh, Lectureship Day, and so we're very pleased to have our very special guest, Dr. Nagar Chalasani. Uh, is the David, Grab, uh, David Crabb Professor of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. Scott will give a more sort of formal introduction uh, uh, to Naga and his work uh, later today at 4.30. So uh, today um, I want to sort of introduce uh, the format of our debate, all right? Um, so the format will be uh, two cases, all right? The first debate will be the question, is this case a severe um, autoimmune um, hepatitis or a drug and liver injury case? And presenting one side of the argument is, this is Dilly, so don't do a biopsy by JP. Is JP here? JP is there, okay, <laughs> awesome. My argument, and then on the flip side will be uh, the argument that, yes, this is autoimmune hepatitis, so yes, you need to do a biopsy by CAM, all right? And then um, case two, and then we'll have a resolution by Dr. Chalasani. Uh, he'll, uh, he'll sort of give his assessment. And also, you don't realize that uh, your decision will determine whether or not the fellows will graduate. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Cam, our chief fellow, this is his third year of uh, transplant hepatology. <laughs> fellow. So Cam, Cam, this may be your year, all right? Good luck, okay? All right, second case. They already paid you. Okay, all right. Well, you're in a tough spot. You're in a tough spot then, all right. Case two will be the debate to biopsy or not to biopsy based on this uh, complicated case. Argument one will be uh, no biopsy and treat empirically by Zach Borman, who's one of our uh, rotating GI fellows here at Mount Sinai. Thank you very much for filling in for one of our full-time hepatology fellows. And argument two will be Arpan Patel uh, arguing biopsy should be is necessary to help guide treatment. So let's get started with the case, all right? Case one. This is a patient who is a 29-year-old woman, uh, gravita 2, para 1, okay, so she's pregnant, 19 weeks. Uh, she presents now with jaundice after taking a single dose of amoxicillin about three weeks ago. She does have a history of having jaundice one year ago while on methimazole. Uh, that history is a little vague because she was in Europe, actually, at the time for some thyroid condition. She reports that her jaundice improved as after the cessation of the methimazole and without any meds or any kind of interventions, including liver biopsy. She has no surgical history. Uh, she takes prenatal vitamins, no herbal dietary supplements. Uh, she really doesn't have any uh, sort of toxic habits, and she emigrated from Ecuador about 10 years ago. Uh, her vital signs are pretty unremarkable. BMI is 20. She is clearly jaundice with scleral icterus, but otherwise looks quite healthy. She has uh, abdominal distension consistent with a 19-week pregnancy, no stigmata of chronic liver disease noted, and otherwise she actually looks quite well, except for the jaundice. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of data, imaging, normal size, but diffusely echogenic liver, no biliary dilatation, and uh, an ultrasound showing a viable fetus consistent with the 19-week pregnancy. She has uh, an echocardiogram that demonstrates a normal EF, um, and RV systolic pressure, and these are some of her labs. So um, you can see some depression in the CBC, uh, otherwise pretty normal uh, BMP, but markedly uh, abnormal uh, hepatic uh, panel, uh, elevated bilirubin, transaminases in the thousands, INR 2.2. Uh, some of the work up here is uh, for rare uh, hepatitis are negative. But she does have a pretty impressive uh, serologies here, ANA, IgG, very elevated, uh, but other sort of more specific biomarkers are negative. Okay, so this is our first debate. Is this severe autoimmune hepatitis or DILI? What's the role of liver biopsy? So I think JP, you're going to start us off. Okay. I prepared a script, so I'm timed. All right. All right, so uh, Dr. Chalsani, Dr. Friedman, the rest of the faculty, Michael Fellows, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. So, you know, my argument is that our patient has drug induced liver injury, and although liver biopsies are potentially helpful in some cases of DILI, this particular patient um, does not have an immediate need for a liver biopsy. So, let us begin with a few key facts in this case. She's a young pregnant woman with jaundice, abnormal liver chemistries after um, starting amoxicillin, taking amoxicillin. Ecuadorian with a normal BMI, 
elevated ANA titers, and gamma, uh, hypergamma globulinemia. There is no biliary obstruction, no hepatic vascular disease, viral serologies are negative, and she has no previous history of liver disease. Now, the R index allows us to classify liver injury as either hepatocellular or cholestatic, depending on the relationship or the ratio of the ALT and the alkaline phosphatase. Our patient, based on the R index, clearly has hepatocellular liver injury. We also know from the chemistries that she also has severe liver injury. Not only are the transaminases more than 20, 30 times upper limit of normal, but she also is jaundiced and she has coagulopathy. Now, a mildly elevated alphos, as we all know, is not, um, necessary, is not abnormal in pregnancy at all. Uh, her meld sodium is 26, and it is important to note that she does not have hepatic encephalopathy, which means that she was not in acute liver failure. Now, the Dili Network Severity Index will classify her liver injury as either moderate to severe. Now, the only thing that's really separating her from overtly severe disease is the presence of hepatic decompensation like ascites or encephalopathy, as well as other organ failures like renal failure um, or respiratory failure, anything like that. I also like to point out High's Law, um, and according to this law, patients with both hepatocellular injury as well as jaundice have up to 50, 10 to 50% risk of either transplant or death. Now, despite the presence of autoantibodies, I argue that our patient more likely has DILI than autoimmune hepatitis. Now, let's begin our discussion a little bit with, you know, attributing liver in, or the process of attributing liver injury to a drug. Now, we, either, we do this either through uh, expert opinion or expert consensus or through the aid of causality assessment methods, such as the roussel lucroff method or the RUCAMP. Now, as we see in this slide, um, RUCAMP considers several clinical variables that include the timing of drug index, uh, intake and the symptom onset, age, alcohol, and other drug use, in the presence of competing diagnoses, known, drug hepatotoc uh, known hepatotoxicity of the drug in question, and a positive drug rechallenge. Through RUCAM, DILI is characterized from being excluded up to being highly probable, the drug being highly probable. If we go back to our patient, um, she has the typical interval between drug intake and symptom onset, about three weeks. She does not have competing diagnosis. And I should point out that in, 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 in RUCAM, in the list of their competing diagnosis, autoimmune hepatitis is not there. And hepatotoxicity is actually a known adverse drug reaction of amoxicillin. It's, in the, it's in, in the drug label. So based on RUCAM, she has probable DILI. Now, liver talk. Yes, sir. This patient only took one dose of amoxicillin. Correct. Are there other instances where you get really after a single dose? Um, so, so in, in, in liver talks, at least for amoxicillin, they did describe it using credit. Uh, not after a single dose. Ah. So, I'm not sure. actually, if you mm -hmm. look hard, orally administered drug, I can't think of an instance after a single dose. You mm -hmm. have anesthetics, mm -hmm. single administration. Right. You know, single administration of intravenous, for example, suffers for mm -hmm. cause mm -hmm. But I don't think a single dose of amoxicillin, mm -hmm. unless your this is a rich challenge. You know, even then you have a hypersensitivity reaction. Otherwise, I think that's one that all gives the case. Amoxicillin. But what do you make out of really she had the glutamazole? Explain to this at all. Um, so, methimazole can cause, you know, jaundice, a cholestatic pattern. Um, it, you know, interestingly, I, I think in the Spanish Dillon, Dilly Register, they, they look at um, uh, repeat cases of Dilly for two drugs. They were able to identify, you know, in their, in their, in their, in their network, I think about nine cases of rechallenge. And interestingly, on the second rechallenge, most of the presentation turned out to be autoimmune. The interesting part is seven out of nine were either structurally related, similar targets, or similar drug classes. And only two cases, I think, if I remember correctly, were the, the, the medications of different categories and different classes, which would be like methimazole and amoxicillin in this case. So it's, is it, it's still possible. Um, but again, I think based on that data, we would probably expect uh, you know, a relationship in, in medications that are maybe you know, similar targets or similar uh, chemical structure. Or she took more than the one dose she said she took. Correct. Or she took some in the past and, well, maybe had a milder reaction that never, she never actually uh, was captured in. in, in um, Has anything known about potential for molecular mimicry of uh, amoxicillin with amoxicillin? So, 
I, I'm not too sure about molecular mimicry. I mean, I do know that at least, oh, for metamethyl, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure about the answer. Yeah. Did you have kind of that? I don't think it was provided in the, in the vignette, so I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, although she did not have a white count. Or, or white, certainly not. I mean, I recall she had very, very mild. Just to accept outside of breast syndromes, is synophilia really not playing out in our daily experience? You know, it's just all over the place. You have some synophilia and, and the hypersensitivity phenotype doesn't really. So the breast syndrome that you see for chronic synophilia, otherwise it's really not. Even uh, Bjornsson had some data, if you have synophilia and the biopsy, your outcomes are better. That's what he wrote when he was in, uh, in Sweden, but that's not really our experience. Thank you. Um, so going back to liver tox, um, you know, for amoxicillin, it's known to cause fast cell injury. Um, its likelihood score is B, which means it's likely, albeit it's rare, it can cause both hepatocellular and cholestatic injury. I'd like to point out that maybe for the cholestatic site, like clavulanic acid is actually kind of like the more associated or augmented rather than amoxicillin itself. The latency period uh, in cases are, are thought to be short. And they did observe rapid improvement in enzymes following uh, withdrawal of the medication. And in the Dillon network, uh, Dillon network, I'm sorry, uh, in, in amoxicillin clavulanate um, is actually the top individual uh, agent that's known to uh, cause Dillon. Now, of course, we may argue that what about the ANA and the IgG? Well, first, in otherwise healthy community dwelling individuals, um, up to 2.5% may have positive ANA. Now, in patients with DILI that are not classically associated with autoimmunity, for you know, and by these classic associations, I mean uh, nitrofurantoin and mi minocycline, in these DILI patients, up to 22% may still have positive ANA, and up to 9% may still have um, gamma globulinemia. And in a study by by Licata, um, they did note that patients with with uh, presumed DILI and positive autoantibodies. Only 25% of them will eventually be diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis after they do a biopsy. Having said that, ANA and high IgG does not necessarily mean that this patient has autoimmune hepatitis. Now, can this patient still have autoimmune hepatitis? Now, if you look at the scoring system of the international AIH group, um, our patient will have nine points, still below what is considered probable. However, you know, Dr. Porma may argue that if we biopsy, then the points go up to 14. If all the features are there, and then it becomes probable. Um, having said that, I do feel that we should still hold off on a liver biopsy at this moment, and that instead what we should be doing is closely monitoring her liver enzymes and her clinical mm -hmm. stats. First, a liver biopsy is not really required to diagnose DILI, and it will not definitively diagnose DILI. Um, in, in the Dillon uh, network inclusion and exclusion criteria, it's not a necessary uh, component of the inclusion criteria. And in fact, clinical suspicion and biochemical abnormalities are actually more important. Um, also, um, uh, also 90 percent of DILI patients will recover in six months. Even among ecteric patients, um, recovery will, you know, still remains the rule. Uh, Liver-related mortality and liver transplant is about five percent or less at, at six months. It is, however, not zero which means that you know, this underscores the importance of close monitoring, which is what I'm advocating for here. Liver biopsy may be useful in cases um, if uh, the biochemical abnormalities, say, are persistent or are getting worse during our monitoring period. Now, the fact that we can do a liver biopsy does not mean that we should do one uh, because a liver biopsy still has risks. Uh, most commonly, pain happens in 85% of patients, and more seriously, you get bleeding and death. Um, occurring in one uh, in 2,500 or one in 10,000, respectively, and a study, uh, a population study in Sweden, um, where out of 1.9 million live births, births, there were 23 biopsies done between 92 and 2001. Uh, they showed that liver biopsy was associated with SGA as well as low birth weight. However, I do like to point out, and you know, and I think maybe Dr. Porma might point this out, that in this study, though it's more likely that these adverse fetal outcomes are not necessarily from the biopsy itself, but the fact that these patients are probably sicker. Having said that, I do like to point out that there are so few liver biopsies, and so suggesting that there is and there should be a very high threshold to perform one during pregnancy. So 
Dr. Pormai will say, well, liver biopsy will change management, but will it really? Yes, they're negative. So, first, let me point out that a liver biopsy may not necessarily tease out AIH from Dilly. Dr. Peel is here. She probably can. <laughs> she probably can. <laughs> but <laughs> four blinded liver pathologists reviewed slides from patients with clinically diagnosed autoimmune hepatitis and Dilly. And clinical and histologic diagnoses were concordant in only 60 to 70 percent of cases. And moreover, the four pathologists did not have a unanimous histologic diagnosis in more than 50 percent of cases. Second, autoimmune histologic features are not necessarily uncommon in Dilly. In a study by DeBoer based on Dillon data, even in Dilly with negative autoantibodies, interface hepatitis was found in 100 percent of their patients plasma cells in 40% of their patients, and hepatic rosettes in 80% of their patients. Thus, even if we find these features on biopsy, if you're, if you're not Dr. Phil, we cannot really conclude that our patient has autoimmune hepatitis. Now, several case series will show that steroids effectively induce remission in patients with drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis. In these case series, more than 90% of patients who received steroids or immunomodulators like azathioprine achieved either biochemical remission, uh, improvement or remission. Now, even though these immunosuppressives show imp uh, impressive results, I need to point out that none of these are randomized or, con or, randomized or controlled, and all except Dillon are actually retrospective. Now, while case definitions of autoimmune hepatitis are clear in these studies, drug causality assessments are often not. In fact, in one of the studies they mentioned, it, it was, it, it, you know, they didn't use the structured uh, CAM methods. It was all, you know, clinical judgment. But you could argue that's expert opinion. So, um, Furthermore, because almost all patients in these studies receive immunosuppressives, we do not really know the natural history of untreated patients. For example, in DeBoer's paper, even though less than 50% received steroids, more than 90% had normal chemistries at the end of follow-up. In other words, do immunosuppressives really help, or are we just seeing the natural course of Dilly? Our patients should not receive steroids at, the, at this moment, immediately. While steroids may be effective, we do not know if it is better than doing nothing. Steroids are category C in pregnancy, although I would like to point out that a systematic review um, done by uh, in a rheumatology journal did not show an association between steroids and adverse fetal and maternal outcomes. Finally, it is important to note that not a few patients with severe autoimmune hepatitis who receive steroids, which would be our patient if Dr. Foreman would have his way, will get <laughs> infected. In a case series of patients with acute or severe AIH, one in four will get a, will get a bad infection, yet only one in two will end up responding to steroids. In summary, we have a young uh, pregnant patient with severe hepatocellular liver injury, which I believe is more likely due to Dilly. We should defer liver biopsy now, given its risks and in the uncertainty as to how it changes immediate management. In the short run, close monitoring is the way to go, since recovery after drug discontinuation is the rule, while significant drug-related or liver-related adverse outcomes are thankfully rare. Thank you. Rebuttal. Damn. Maybe this is your year. That's my <laughs> Probably not. Although you're back with us next year. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you, JP, for that. You know, before I really start this, I just want to like emphasize that I want you to take your way, you know, you know, don't think about this patient on the screen, but imagine if this patient was your loved one, your daughter, <laughs> your wife, <laughs> someone you know, okay? and just waiting for the dilly to improve on its own. Is that good enough? And this patient who's pregnant, your loved one, all right, with acute liver injury in the thousands of Billy of 18 and coagulopathy in IR 2.2. Not in failure, but just someone you know and love. You're just going to sit there and watch them? Let's talk a little bit more. So, so, yeah. <laughs> true. All right, so, um, yeah, so there's, so there's no so so we're gonna talk about biopsying this patient. So there's no way to know with certainty that this what this patient has without a biopsy, right? Acute liver injury, coagulopathy. She took a dose of moxicillin. In all my years of experience, I've never seen anyone 
have Gilly after one dose of amoxicillin. And I've been around for a while. So, let alone is this autoimmune hepatitis, is there like some other cause of liver injury? Again, a lot of the serologists got to go against that, but what, what is going on here? All right? It's not one life, it's two. <laughs> liver biopsy during pregnancy is safe. I'm glad that JP brought up that Swedish study because I'm going to get back to that. And I'm going to prove to you why it is. And then confirmation of autoimmune hepatitis has appropriate, and, it, and its appropriate management has implications for the mother and the fetus. So let's talk about this. So, um, so a little bit about autoimmune hepatitis and the diagnosis. So the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group proposed the diagnostic criteria in 1993. It was revised in 1999. Um, these criteria were mostly allowed, you know, for comparison among studies of studies uh, for for scientific studies among different centers. This is the criteria that JP initially kind of went into, um, saying nine points was didn't really meet the criteria. However, due to the complexity of these criteria and that they were insufficiently validated, the criteria that he showed. Um, they went back and they revised it for a simplified scoring system. And this is the scoring system that we use in clinical practice. Um, it's something that's more simple and wider applicability. So, and this was based on a retrospective, on, based on a retrospective cohort study. They used a validation cohort of 350 IAH patients against 393 controls to kind of validate that this um, criteria would actually made sense and had high sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis. So this is the criteria, the simplified diagnostic criteria um, you can see here it's all listed um, over on the bottom. You know, a score of six is um, probable, what they call probable autoimmune hepatitis, sensitivity um, of 88 and specificity of 97%. A score of seven is definite autoimmune hepatitis with a specificity of 99%. You cannot get a score of seven or a definite diagnosis without histology. What does our patient have? So she has six points. So her ANA, her ANA is 1 to 80. The fact that it's not just mildly positive, it's moderately positive because it's not 1 but 2 points. IgG is 1.1 uh, per limit, so that's 2 more points. Absence of viral hepatitis is 2 points, so 6 points. So we have a woman here who may, as a probable chance, of having autoimmune hepatitis. However, we can't confirm it. So let's talk about, you know, you know, in, a, in patients that we assume that may have autoimmune hepatitis, we often get biopsies on them before we subject them to high-dose immunosuppression for an extended period of time, right? That usually is what we do. We don't usually start people on steroids and just like watch them because um, they usually need steroids for a period. So the ASLD actually doesn't comment on liver biopsy during pregnancy. However, the ACG does recommend that pregnant women with abnormal liver tests undergo standard workup as with any non-pregnant individual and that liver biopsy can be performed safely. Recent data from that Swedish study that JP cited um, actually supports that biopsy is safe. This is almost 2 million patients um, that analyzed the registry data um, over, over almost two decades. A compare uh, adverse outcomes in uh, pregnant women that underwent biopsy under, uh, against pregnant women um, that did, un did not have biopsy, and also compared um, groups of patients who had the biopsy against patients uh, against women that had uh, diagnosis of liver disease, as well as uh, uh, patients uh, as, well, as well as women um, that had liver biopsies peri um, peri around their pregnancies, either before or after their pregnancy. And I'll tell you why that's important. So in this study, 23 pregnant women had liver biopsies out of the 2 million. Right, it's not a lot, but you know, this doesn't happen that often. The mean age is 31, our patient's 30. Um, 17 had a recorded liver diagnosis before pregnancy. 15 of these patients were inpatients, and then almost none of them stayed for more, one, more than one day in the hospital, actually. None of them had a diagnosis of bleeding in conjunction with the biopsy, zero. Um, and none of them had any steel blurs. Remember, there's only 23 patients here, um, but in this biggest cohort, this is the best study we have. None of them had any, any major adverse outcomes here. So here's a table looking at um, uh, the, the demographic of patients. So I'm going to kind of focus here on these first two columns here. So on, on this, this is the patients comparing patients that had liver biopsy during pregnancy against women during pregnancy. So they did, these are patients that did not have um, liver disease or anything, and they just kind of went through their pregnancy. What's the difference in outcome? So preterm birth, so see here, still birth zero. Any preterm birth. You know, maybe reaching statistical significance a little bit here against, you know, uh, doing a biopsy in a very preterm patient with one patient. However, nothing else kind of statistically significant. No difference in induction of labor or C-section need. There was a little bit of small gestational age difference um, in the patients that got biopsied, um, a little bit for low birth weight infants as well. There was no major congenital malformation in any of the patients that got biopsied. But what I think is more actually important is the fact that, you know, I think it's kind of silly to compare patients that are getting a liver biopsy to healthy women 
undergoing pregnancy, right? The fact that you're getting a liver biopsy means you're a little bit unhealthy to begin with, right? So I don't think it's fair to gauge, um, you know, the outcomes in your fetus against a healthy control. So this is looking at patients that had any diagnosis of liver disease, and you'll see the differences then become a little bit more narrow. So that almost statistical significance in preterm um, birth is now completely obviated. And then you'll see the small for gestational age difference is also now not statistically significant between these two groups of patients. Taking another look at this, looking at relative risk, crude relative risk, it's really hard to do a multivariate analysis are, so you can't really do that with Skyland data. So the best we have is, um, is uh, crude relative risk. So look at the relative risk again, comparing that first group of patients, pregnant women with biopsies against all healthy women, um, oh yeah, oh. Keep, keep um, yeah. So you'll see that there is that there is um, you know a slight increase relative risk of small um, birth weight infants and small for gestational age. It does not include one there in the interval, so it is a little bit significant. However, when we start um, separating that out between these demographics of patients, so now let's compare these pregnant women that got biopsy to patients with liver disease. Not they didn't get biopsy, but they had a diagnosis of liver disease. I think it's kind of fair to say the whole preterm um, birth. You know, it was almost significant, um, but um, now it, okay. it's, but now it's less it's significant. Like and then uh, the small for gestational age, still significant, but less so. The relative risk is actually coming down. Now let's compare this group of patients that got biopsy to patients that got a liver biopsy before they were pregnant. So this is most applicable, right? So now we're comparing the patients that got biopsy during pregnancy to patients that, uh, to women that got biopsy before their pregnancy or after their pregnancy. So they had liver disease to some extent, that required a biopsy. So I think this is somewhat similar of a patient population. And here, the interval even you know, becomes a little bit more wide and the relative risk actually decreases even further here. So even with this risk, even if you're going to put them to completely healthy controls, which I don't think is reasonable, um, no in increased risk of preterm birth, induction of labor or C-section, and again, there's a relative risk of low birth rate, but I don't think it's significant enough to, to obviate the need to do a biopsy. So what did this study show? None of the pregnancies exposed to liver biopsy ended in stillbirth. There was no statistically significant increase in preterm birth, and overall adverse outcomes in pregnancy were rare with liver biopsy. Therefore, it should not be avoided because of pregnancy when there's a medical education to do it. Um, and that's where the, the, you know, the major part of this is because pretend this patient wasn't pregnant. Would you do a biopsy in this patient to confirm autoimmune hepatitis? Yes, right? So don't. there's no data here to suggest you should be afraid of it. That's really the major point here. But... Just talking about very briefly kind of adverse outcomes that autoimmune hepatitis, the same group actually looked back and they saw that patients with autoimmune hepatitis during pregnancy had higher risks of bad things happening to them, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, low birth weight infants. Not surprising. This has been confirmed in other studies, citing as much as a 26% chance of an adverse pregnancy outcome in patients that have autoimmune hepatitis. And they put data in here, but if you treat the autoimmune hepatitis, there actually are better outcomes to the fetus, but I'll kind of spare you for that in the interest of time. I also just want to talk about severe autoimmune hepatitis and acute liver failure briefly here. So there's no great definitions for what acute severe autoimmune hepatitis is, but the general accepted one is uh, patients that are jaundiced with an IR greater 1.5 that don't meet failure criteria. Our patient is an acute severe autoimmune hepatitis patient, okay? And so multiple studies have demonstrated the risk of developing acute liver failure in this demographic of patients. So two studies here, majority, over 50% in both of them developed acute liver failure when they presented this, type, this severe, okay? And so a pregnant woman coming in with severe autoimmune hepatitis, we don't have the luxury of time to wait and see what happens to these liver enzymes over time. We have to make a decision. We have to make a decision quickly, okay? Because over half of them will develop acute liver failure. We can't have, you know, imagine what's going to happen to the mother and child in that, in that event. Um, there was a study with, a, you know, the ALF group recently published a study looking at um, 361 ALF patients, 66 with autoimmune hepatitis, 131 with daily actually, and 164 indeterminate, thought to be maybe a, a daily uh, autoimmune um, you know, what they found that the overall survival didn't really change so much with steroids once they had acute liver failure. However, I didn't put the data here, but patients that had acute severe autoimmune hepatitis and not in failure, you can still salvage them. So we need to prevent her to progressing to acute liver failure. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting a biopsy and treating her. Because the second she tips over into the ALF category, her, her, her prognosis is dismal. All right. So in her MELD, MELD of 26, if you calculate it in this study, there was no real response to steroids um, between groups. So groups that got steroids and groups that didn't. Overall or spontaneous survival, meaning overall survival, spontaneous survival means um, you know, transplant-free survival. There was no statistically significant difference there, and they didn't really respond as well. Steroids, we have a narrow window to get her under control, and we got to get a biopsy. There's no time to wait. Biopsy, confirm it, give her steroids. Let's give her the best shot she can. 
So in summary, this patient's jaundiced with coagulopathy and meets probable criteria for amonium hepatitis. She's someone you love with two, two lives instead of one. All right? Liver biopsy is overall safe from pregnancy. Pretend she's not pregnant. You would still do this. And confirming the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis has implications for, for prognostication and treatment. If she does have acute severe autoimmune hepatitis, it's important to treating it as aggressive as we can because she has a, as a, is at high risk for de developing acute liver failure. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Cam, for that impassioned argument. <laughs> I think you really want to graduate. OK, so to Dr. Chalasani, so the, uh, case one summary and decision. Um, this is the debate, 29-year-old woman uh, pregnant with these serologies. What are your, what are your thoughts? Oh yeah. <laughs> this is a tough case. Though. This is a bit messy. This is um, it's hot, and you could argue both ways. You could say this is not Billy, and you could say this is not AI either. Um, why is this not Billy? Amoxicillin is not a common cause. It's widely used. The frequency of this severe Billy after a single dose is exceptionally rare. That alone is the reason I think this is. No, it doesn't smell mm -hmm. like uh, a uh, acute a daily case. There are a few things that go uh, in favor of NIH. You have the right age group. Uh, you have low grade, low titers autoantibodies. Uh, and then you also, when you do this, I mean, computing workup is negative. Biopsy would help, you know, but not necessary. I mean, you're not doing biopsy on all autoimmunes. You know, for example, with Julia biopsy, this person is not a uh, is not pregnant. Not always. It, you, know. you, you do. Yeah, it, it, I think pregnancy is a key factor in terms of determining uh, whether or not you would quickly go to biopsy. I think if this person wasn't pregnant, we wouldn't be having a discussion about biopsy or no biopsy. Did you just do it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I think. And I, I think I. I if you just pull other hepatologists, I'm not sure. I think I, I mean, I would, I could see myself trying steroids. Well, because you know, without a biopsy. Oh, Even without a biopsy. Without a biopsy. And biopsy. A diagnostic and therapeutic trial. Diagnostic and therapeutic trial. You know, for example, if this patient, let's say, if uh, Joe enrolled this patient with Bill, we would do the causality six months later, mm -hmm. and we would heavily depend mm -hmm. on if the patient got steroids for causality assessment. Patient got steroids and what the treatment response is. In this case, you don't have that. You know, so you're you're depending on a biopsy if you give steroids or not steroids. I personally would not biopsy this, this patient. I would get a challenge with steroids and see how uh, I wouldn't expect INR to improve dramatically, but you can see uh, response in the transport. And then you know, I have a member of the OB department Tatiana. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 and then INR can also be almost static and vitamin A kind of affects here. I mean, it might not all be the same. But there is there is jaundice, there is high uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the, the therapy, like higher steroids to see what happens. What that that to me what? seems like. What about the local <laughs> labor the camp? Does it suggest you might have one unrecognized part? Yeah, so that's another possibility that she had uh, after metamazole, exactly. you know, Joanne, she ended up with a low grade AIH, and now this is a flare. That's another really compelling uh, suggestion as well. The other thing is her serologies are really not that impressive. I mean, AMA 1 to 80 and IVG 18 and negative to muscle. I mean, I think that also kind of makes me not as concerned for autoimmune hepatitis as I would. But that's though you you have, but you don't really have a strong case for Dilly either. So but, you just. But, but I think that's also the argument for biopsy. If she was not pregnant, the reason I would biopsy her yeah. is because everything's so weakly positive. Her AMA is only one in eighty. It's not even one time, you know, one and a half times the upper limit of normal. So eighteen hundred. I think the just my yeah. argument is the response to steroid is probably more diagnostic than a biopsy. Mm -hmm. You know, especially if you're thinking about Dilly. Within yeah. a little too early for a sweet bag of a pregnancy test now, right? Yeah. 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 How long? How long? Yeah. And also, yeah. How long would you give the steroids for when you where you give you know, up? I think even within a day three, day four, you know, day three that you're four. giving high, yeah. you know, 
high enough hydrocortisone or insolumental or one of those, within day three, day four, you start seeing what I call melting of the neurotransmitter. Just by going to see that. So for the sake of time, let's move on. Where there was a biopsy done, okay, and so this biopsy shows uh, portal tracts expanded by inflammation and severe interface hepatitis. You can see the inset there. There's actually presence of plasma cell predominant infiltrate with EOS and severe interface hepatitis, and a lot of confluent necrosis, steroid containing macrophages and acidophil bodies. And the report that you get is. The findings are consistent with severe acute hepatitis compatible with drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis. What do you do with this kind of uh, report? Uh, amoxicillin is not typically uh, associated with drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis. It's nitroferon to immunocycline. You have hydralazine, methyl dopamine, rarely statins, very rarely statins. There you have one in a million types of stuff. Amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulinic acid or it's not the one you think of. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think this may have come because the history was provided to the pathologist, like there was a concern for billing, so, but I, I would, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to tease out. There are a couple studies that are ongoing at the moment. There's one we have done there. We've done uh, autoantigen arrays, uh, autoantibody arrays in patients with something like this. And when you do heat maps compared to pure billing, let's say, Isoniazid, nitrofurantoin, in these cases, you can just see there are some trends of water antibodies. So I think more work needs to be done. I suspect within a few years we may have a signature for this. There may be specific water antibodies. Otherwise, it's pretty gray zone. It's tough. Okay. You know? But I think steroids to me be the savior. Give steroids and see. Um, you know, you could argue high dose steroids and complications, but here there's a coagulopathic uh, pregnant woman. Okay. So you're leaning to autoimmune then in this case. Okay, Cam, I think, uh, yeah, all right. So great job. Okay. I mean, a biopsy is yeah. suggested. You know, you don't see uh, plasma cells as many, just a pure billion. No, the plasma cells are in the portal tract. So if you just eliminate this picture, which is the lobular activity, the portal tracts really are difficult for autoimmune events. But what's What's not typical is the lobular disarray, which is more of a daily component. So that's why the and the lack of significant fibrosis also points towards the drug induced autoimmune hepatitis. The lack of so I didn't, so to, to finish up the, the case, I'll tell you that I didn't give you all the information. Okay, oh. and one bit of information that we actually learned after giving her steroids, of course, which she did not respond to, was that she did take amoxicillin when she was first sick in her first episode of jaundice. Where she took it for a couple of days, so this was really a re-challenge. Yeah, it would be unusual, especially you know, still metamazole is far more hepatotoxic. Than, mm -hmm. you know, I think there is even a black box for that. Yeah. As to and she ended up needing a transplant, actually. Did she? Yeah, but she did fine. What happened to her pregnancy? She lost her pregnancy, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but not as a result of the biopsy. This is no, this no, is no, a good case. Yeah. And a great discussion. So. Okay. All right, let's move on to our next case. Uh, we have a little bit, we're a little short on time, but I'll go through this quickly. This is a 39-year-old a Korean man, it's not me, okay, with <laughs> elevated liver enzymes, referred to you for elevation, uh, for evaluation. He has an interesting history of AFib as a consequence of uh, uh, heart uh, repair and surgery. He had the ASD repair five years ago, and since then he's been on uh, uh, amiodarone, 200 milligrams daily, and this herbal supplement as well family history of Alzheimer's disease. He does report a regular use of about three to four drinks a day, but it doesn't affect his uh, working full time. On exam, uh, you can see pretty normal bile signs. Uh, BMI is about 24. Well appearing, looks fine, anecteric, uh, different than another case. Normal sized echogenic liver, however. And you can see on his labs uh, some mild derangements. You can see an AST, ALT elevation with uh, sort of predominance uh, as well. Mildly elevated ALKFOS, but you know, liver synthetic function is fine. You can see uh, purposely there's some uh, borderline uh, metabolic markers here, HOMA IR, uh, A1C, fibrosis mm -hmm. score, which is indeterminate. Uh, some evidence of liver uh, fibrosis, perhaps, and uh, elevated CAP score as well. All right. So the debate moving on uh, is to biopsy or not to biopsy 
uh, in management. So I think we're going to start off with Zach, who's going to argue no biopsy and treatment. All right, thank you. So um, I'm going to convince you that we do not need a biopsy for this patient. So let's just go back for a second and distill out a lot of data. Uh, you took a very good history on the patient. Thank you. 39-year-old, um, so 39-year-old Korean male has a BMI of 24, which I'll come back to, on amiodarone, and he didn't quite tell us this, but it sounds like the ASD repair was about five years ago, so probably about five years of amiodarone, 73 grams a year at 200 micrograms a day, or milligrams a day, uh, and then you get to about 365 grams of cumulative uh, exposure. Also, an average of 21 to 28 drinks a day, a week, um, and then there's some evidence of steatohepatitis without cirrhosis, but there is fibrosis. Um, so the differential, you know, would be alcoholic steatohepatitis, so ASH, uh, DILI from the amiodarone, or potentially a lean NASH, and, I, and again, I'm going to come back to that with uh, Korean male. So um, just starting with ASH, so uh, if you go back, this is actually from 1996, it's a typo, but uh, there was a prospective cohort study of over 13,000 patients from Copenhagen um, where they looked at uh, alcohol exposure and then subsequent liver disease. And they figured out that there's a, a very significant inflection point. Um, and that's, that's when you hit 7 to 13 drinks weekly for women or 14 to 27 drinks weekly for men. And this is what went into the, um, uh, uh, the guidelines for how much alcohol um, sort of we consider in a, an appropriate amount for our patients to be drinking. So for men, no more than four drinks a day, but no more than 14 a week. And then women, uh, no more than three drinks in a day and uh, uh, only seven drinks a week again, based on these um, data. And uh, our non-invasive, um, you know, another reason why uh, you don't always need biopsy is that our non-invasive techniques are very good. And Dr. Chalasani does a lot of work on this as well, and I'm going to show a little more. But uh, for uh, FibroScan, for instance, uh, when you look at FibroScan for uh, uh, alcoholic steatohepatitis and you choose a cut point, a KPA of 15, um, uh, the negative predict predictive value is actually 98% for F3 fibrosis when we would really um, start getting worried about uh, approaching cirrhosis. So uh, in, this, in this patient's case, I, I think it was like 7.8 uh, or so KPAs. So very unlikely for this patient to have uh, F3 fibrosis or certainly cirrhosis. Um, they're, they're more likely an F2. This was a remarkable study because... Uh Biopsies were done on people without no liver disease attending this alcohol mm. And I was the AE for gastro at the time, so there was a lot of controversy whether to take it or not. But you know, it was scientifically solid because everybody had uh, biopsies done. Almost asymptomatic. It can be done on this. And then, you know, Dr. Chalasani, uh, in his guidelines for Dili, you know, again, you, you, take a, you have to take a very broad history, uh, labs, um, uh, look through your differential, uh, and there's very good, uh, the guideline's very good at sort of walking you through how to assess for uh, DILI. Um, and so in our patient's case, you know, when you, when you plug in Royal Bee Jelly, you don't get anything. Uh, <laughs> Royal Bee Jelly is like uh, used in some mice. It's like supposed to be anti-inflammatory. Uh, there's no, no signs of any liver toxicity, as far as I can tell, uh, but maybe I'll, I'll be proved wrong. Uh, and, but amiodarone, for sure, has a cumulative drug effect. And uh, there's a lot of controversy, but, but starting at probably around 50 grams are some cases of, um, of fibrosis and then uh, development later of cirrhosis. And this is just an example they show uh, from liver tox of a patient who had cumulative exposure over uh, eight and a half years, ultimately uh, died of liver failure. So uh, who cares what the biopsy shows? Are we going to really you know, continue this patient on amiodarone? Um, and that's a question that we can talk about at the end. Uh, Dr. Chalasani did this work, uh, and some of the others already mentioned it. You know, cardiovascular agents can uh, contribute to DILI. You know, they looked at almost 1,300 patients, and then after exclusion uh, criteria, it came down to 899. One important thing to know is that if this is DILI, uh, that the fact that he has fibrosis already means that he's at higher risk uh, for complications uh, down the road. So patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, have a, a, both a higher risk for DILI, but also uh, potentially a higher mortality um, uh, than those who don't. And in NASH, uh, 
the Lancet has looked at uh, back in 2004, they were determining whether Asian populations should have different cutoffs for BMI uh, than, than Caucasian populations. They ultimately decided no, but I just, yeah, please. Sure. Studies acute billing. Mm -hmm. So what you're describing in your neuron, that is what turns out to be that is chronic. I see. Okay. So this mortality and all that superimposed acute on chronic, that is more an acute delay, which can happen with the neuron, but only with the you know, early induction type, you know, IV doses, not with, uh, this is more chronic, more steatotic, more possible lipidosis, you know, the learning that sort of is a different type of thing. Yeah, the chronic part of, of amiodarone <coughs> actually was, I looked at this closely because it's a mitochondrial toxin. Yeah. So it's intense, you get the ASP over there. So it is cumulative, and you hit the point of no return relatively earlier in the course than you do with, a, with an acute bill. So once, a, once your mitochondria are gone, actually, then it's usually, it's, you know, it's like the original study was by you, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I would have been at the NIH, uh, Jay Gusnagel was using the treat that bee. Right. And he had that, that was such a mitochondrial toxic drug. Uh, it hit the point of no return of nine weeks, uh, <clears throat> actually. So a a everybody who took the drug for nine weeks or longer either died or got a liver transplant. Hmm. Actually, the ones who took it for eight weeks or less, or less survived. So that's why they have this, this brand limit on amiodarone, because it's, it's a much less of a mitochondrial toxin. It depends on the strength of the mitochondria. But once you hit that, that point, then <clears throat> you know, lactic acidosis, liver failure, the whole <clears throat> the whole nine yards. So it's really, this is a really weird type of liver chronic liver toxicity. Okay. Um, and so the one thing, I'll, uh, the takeaway from this slide is just that Asian populations have increased cardiovascular risk factors at lower BMIs. Uh, and, and even though the World Health Organization didn't officially change any cutoffs, uh, you know, this is a Korean male, and so he may be at risk for a lean NASH. And it's hard to sort of differentiate that from uh, the ASH and the um, and, and chronic DILI. Uh, so, to biopsy or not to biopsy? So, um, uh, you know, Dr. Chalasani and his colleagues have done a lot of work on non-invasive markers, um, which continue to improve. In this case, you know, at least following, uh, you know, this doesn't even include, I believe, uh, fiber scan. Um, and so, you know, even based on his uh, uh, sort of uh, non-invasive markers, you could argue that he's a, a intermediate risk, but maybe does not require a liver biopsy uh, because he we've excluded F3 uh, disease. And there are a lot of other. Um, uh, non-invasive markers in the pipeline um, that that may come to fruition within the next couple of years for us uh, to help hone this further. Just want to also point out again, uh, uh, transient elastography uh, fiber scan uh, is actually excellent. And even uh, you know the this study looked at multiple um, multiple scans of the same patients, uh, looked at different weights. Uh, it's very consistent. It's reproducible. Uh, it really really works. Um, and so going back to uh, liver biopsy, you know, liver biopsy does come with risk. Most of these studies are older, but risk of bleeding, risk of infection, risk of, uh, in very rare cases, death. Um, but as I was told by one of uh, Dr. Patel's patients, Dr. Patel is a wizard. Um, <laughs> uh, I was trying to do a paracentesis on him, and he said, I, I would like Dr. Patel because he's a wizard. <laughs> so uh, to... to to end, I'll just say liver biopsy in this patient is probably not, uh, in my opinion, going to change his management. We are going to uh, uh, switch his amiodarone to something else. We're going to stop him from drinking. Uh, and we're also going to encourage him perhaps to lose a little bit of weight uh, and fall below those BMI cutoffs. And then come back in a few months if, if still we have progression of disease, we, don't have, we still have evidence of active hepatitis, then absolutely we can do a biopsy. But I don't think it's indicated at this time. So I'm going to argue on the point of actually using a biopsy to gain the treatment. And the way I wanted to think about this is like, we like to think that we can use these non-invasive scores, we can use these algorithms, but this patient actually has a really complex case. And I think that the pendulum is swung one way in the other direction. We kind of have to go back to what we're actually doing here. 
I wanted to reframe the discussion and talk about this idea of lean NASH because I think it's incredibly relevant to this patient's presentation. Um, these cutoffs are used differently in Eastern and Western countries. You could see the lower cutoffs in um, Asia versus Western countries. But it suffice to say that this uh, prevalence of NAFLD in patients who are, um, who are not obese is very common in the Asian population compared to the US populations in these large cohorts that have been studied. So the other thing that you know, we like to say for these lean NASH patients, if you've looked in the literature before, is that they're kind of thought to be like in between mm -hmm. patients who are obese NASH and patients who are just normal. Maybe they have some metabolic syndrome risk factors. Maybe they have some genotypes that tend to be elevated in their population. But I'm going to argue that sitting on this lean NASH population has its own problems if you don't ignore um, some of the outcomes. And I'm just going to show you briefly two studies. So this is a study published last year that looked at biopsies done of patients from 1970 to 2009, 646 patients. Um, the follow-up time was about 19.3 years. And what they were really looking for was, was there any relative difference in mortality or liver-related events between non-obese NASH and obese NASH? On the left, you could see that uh, obese NASH did have uh, a somewhat higher risk of overall mortality. The um, red line is the obese NASH population, so you could see that their survival curve was lower, although this difference, the log rank, wasn't statistically significant. Shockingly, though, if you look at the, the, the uh, graph on the right is looking at the probability of patients suffering uh, an episode of severe liver disease event, which is like a decompensation or cancer um, or acute liver failure, you can see that green curve, which refers to uh, the population of non-obese NASH, actually having more liver disease related events than the obese NASH population. And so this is kind of striking. And the way that the takeaway from this was that, you know, it might be that this non-obese population has risk factors that are causing their liver disease to accelerate at a much greater degree than the obese population. And so the takeaway is that we shouldn't be sitting on these patients. But what about risk factors that cause them to be Because you had a pretty high prevalence of obesity in your previous slide in the Korean population. Right? 50% mm -hmm. in the Korean population is obese. So if you're lean and you're in a population where 50% are obese, there's probably a reason why you're lean, and maybe that's what you're looking at in this phenotype that you call lean NASH. Maybe it's whatever caused them to be lean in the first place. I think it's the prevalence of NAFL. Yeah, out of the population of NAFL. Um, so just briefly touching on the second study that was done, it was an abstract that came out last year, um, two years ago, was that basically um, comparing, again, the non-obese and the obese NASH population, it seems like morbidity and mortality were comparable in those populations um, compared to the overweight uh, population. But whereas the cardiovascular events are the leading cause of mortality in the obese population, liver disease-related events was the most common cause of morbidity and mortality in the lean patients. So bottom line, we shouldn't sit on these patients. And I think that's how we have to reframe the discussion. We have these, this lean NASH patient in front of us, and we're now trying to struggle with dealing whether they have alcoholic steatohepatitis hepatitis, and DILI as possible risk factors in causing their liver injury. And so I would agree with Zach in saying that I think abstinence is going to definitely be a key portion of therapy. Like, we're going to get that. Um, we're going to get that out of the way in order to really achieve good histologic outcomes for this patient. But are we really okay with just stopping amiodarone in this patient? I mean, we didn't even discuss the trade-offs of stopping a therapy in someone who had AFib and who may have a stroke off it. And I think in real life, it's like very tempting to say that we're just going to stop everything, but it's a different discussion when you're talking about a disease group, and I'm no cardiologist. <laughs> you are a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> so just actually looking at the same liver tox page that um, Zach had alluded to, actual uh, rate of amiodarone-related uh, events, liver events, is super low. It's 1%. And um, the benefit we have is that in addition to steatohepatitis hepatitis being one sort of histologic variant of amiodarone toxicity, there are a lot of other variants. There could be, you can see granulomas and late um, manifestations of amiodarone toxicity. Um, and you can see actually characteristic electron microscopy features. Uh, a tenet of one of the, of the guidelines for uh, NASH that um, followed that's authored by Dr. Chalasani said, liver biopsy should be considered in patients with NAFLD in whom competing etiologies for steatohepatitis hepatitis and the presence and or severity of coexisting chronic liver disease cannot be excluded. And I think given the fact that we are just making this call saying, let's stop amiodarone, 
we're not sure exactly what the what the interaction is between amiodarone and our patient. I think liver biopsy for this reason alone should be considered. So, <laughs> excuse me. So we talked about abstinence. We talked about uh, is it okay to stop amiodarone? Well, what about actually treating this patient? I mean, he's he's lean. I mean, there's only a certain degree of weight loss we can experience in these patients. We all, let alone have our own problems with our own patients losing weight. How are we going to convince a lean patient to lose weight? And I just wanted to remind you of this trial that came out, of weird, which we all know, the Pivens trial, uh, which Dr. Charles Lyon was co-author in, uh, compared different therapies for patients um, who had, in this case, didn't have diabetes, but were, most of them were obese, uh, comparing pioglitazone, vitamin E, and placebo. Clearly, vitamin E was associated with histologic outcomes that were favorable, um, as well as pioglitazone, um, but, these pa but these therapies didn't lead to any reversal of fibrosis. The fact is that in order to qualify and guidelines support this for any therapy or to start any therapy, you need a biopsy. So my conclusion is that, you know, in our case, the fact is that we're already dealing with a patient that might have separate toxicities contributing to liver injury, and we're potentially withholding act treatments that can help them by not doing a biopsy. So I would say that in order to achieve best histological outcomes in this high-risk population, that is really kind of being uh, ignored wholly by a lot of uh, a lot of physicians. We should consider a biopsy because they're complicated enough that we need it in terms of management. Okay, thanks, Arpan. All right, so case two, um, Dr. Shalasani. I mean, of course, though, I, I think both of you sort of label this as an atrophy. Actually, by definition, no. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, but but is he? He he meets he meets the he meets the criteria before the inflection point though technically based on that Be Becker paper right? So so he just drinks too much and also remember we need to call Napoli. The there should not be actually in the table that says no exposure to amiodarone, tetracycline, methotrexate, etc. So this is really not Napoli. The best you can say is this is fatty liver from mixidiology. There's going to be a piece by Arun Sanyal and uh, Jacob George uh, in Gastro. This is sort of a more invited piece. They're starting to argue that this is an artificial separation. Let's just call this fatty liver because you all, we all have seen this obese who drinks a lot mm -hmm. as florid mash. You know, so I think there is that. But I, so I don't. I would not if I if I'm seeing this patient, I would not call him Napoli. Me Napoli. I would just call him maybe fatty liver syndrome mixed. You know, multiple ideologies. I certainly would biopsy them, but just to better understand what's sort of the primary driver, you probably biopsy. You're going to see steatosis, a lot of malory side. Okay, <laughs> our pathologist, I think, was trained here. Rumi and Sina can tell based on the amount, just by experience, the malory side and the amount is this more amiodarone or is it more alcohol? I think that just comes with experience. But I would certainly biopsy. To understand, are we dealing with is this more amiodarone toxicity, which I suspect it is, or is there alcohol? And also, I think it will be, he's only 39 years old. And also, you would want to know the extent of fibrosis. In terms of treating, though, is uh, you, can, you probably would switch from amiodarone to something else, cardone, you know, there is uh, drone derodone, uh, there are a few other things. Uh, just the, uh, there is, Dylan has about 10 cases of amiodarone and better toxicity plus drone burden. And looking at the uh, genetic risk, there is a, a PTPN22, I'll talk this evening, seems to be a risk, as well as there is a HLA signal with the amiodarone. We just have to work more. So, but this is a case that I would certainly buy. Okay. Well, we're going to have to end here. Thank you to Dr. Charles and the Little Fellows for a great discussion.